All right. The four last things, thing two, judgment. The four last things, of course, is the, I guess you could say, quasi-official theme of Advent. Uh, a little counterintuitive for those that are expecting jingle bells and eggnog and tinsel to be the theme of Advent. The theme of Advent is preparation in, a, in reality, preparation for the second coming of Christ. And if that, uh, if that is the essence of Advent, well then there's four things that we ought to think about, the church says, and that is death, judgment, heaven, and hell. We're tackling these four things in three days, which means we have to squish two of them together, which is fine. Uh, so next Sunday will be heaven and hell, and today we're going to talk about judgment. Any one of these items could be talked about for a decade, and you could write a hundred doctoral dissertations on them, so we're not going to get all through this and every implication of this in 35 minutes, but we're going to get the basics down and perhaps um, some fears stoked and some fears allayed, shall we say. <laughs> some fears set aside and others, oh my goodness, there will be a judgment. Uh, uh, maybe such fears related to that will be stirred up. We shall see. But before we do all that, we shall pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has committed to thy holy church the care and nurture of thy people, enlighten with thy wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of thy truth, they may worship thee and serve thee from generation to generation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm compelled, as I read and pray the, the preceding colic there, uh, to point out to you this sentence, enlighten with thy wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of thy truth, they may worship thee from generation to generation. Part of thy truth is death, judgment, heaven, and hell. With the contemplation of these things, we are to rejoice in the knowledge of the truth to recognize that something that you had believed previously was false, you should rejoice that you're closer to the truth now. Uh, I can't find this anywhere, but I heard this years ago, and I've always uh, thought it was a neat thing, that Socrates is uh, storied to, uh, to have said that he wouldn't bother speaking to anyone who wasn't, per who wasn't really pursuing the truth. Because if they weren't really pursuing the truth, then you're wasting your breath. But someone who's really pursuing the truth, you can talk to that person. Because, and the, and the telltale sign is this, when a person who's pursuing the truth is proven to be wrong, they'll rejoice. Because they're now closer to the truth than they were before. Someone who's not really pursuing the truth, when they're proven to be wrong, is furious. And goes back and redoubles their efforts to try and prove why their wrong idea is actually right in the first place. Um, so Socrates says, a person like that, you might as well not even talk to. I always thought that was pretty neat. I try to be the person who rejoices when they're proven wrong. Okay, so uh, if you can prove me wrong in the midst of this, you'll see how happy I am. <laughs> I'll, actually, I'll be mad for a moment. And then I'll say, no, that's good, that's good, you're right, you're right. So, but first of all, we're talking about rejoicing in the truth. Well, let's get to the truth of the judgment, because if you want to find the judgment in the, new, in the Old or New Testament, it's everywhere, okay? Uh, first of all, I want to make a distinction uh, that has been drawn by, by uh, I would say, much of the church, if not most of the church, for most of the church's history. And it, it potentially clarifies something for you, maybe obfuscates something too, but nevertheless... In terms of judgment, the church has talked about judgment, a particular judgment, and a general judgment, okay? In other words, well, let's just see, let's see what the Romans say. Uh, this is from the Roman Catechism. Each man receives his eternal retribution in his immortal soul at the very moment of his death in a particular judgment that refers his life to Christ, either entrance into the blessedness of heaven through a purification, or immediately, or immediate and everlasting damnation. Okay, 
Uh, notice that word particular judgment at the moment of death. In other words, you individually will face some form of judgment at the moment of your death that is called a particular judgment. But we also find in the scriptures and we can infer from the sense of much of the scriptures that there seems to be a gap of, can you call it time, between your death and the general resurrection, where all are raised before the Lord in a general judgment, okay? So there's a differentiation between a particular judgment and a general judgment, both of which are fearful. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just saying that distinction has been made by much of the church. And so we have here an icon of the, the, uh, the, the parable that Jesus tells about Lazarus, and not Lazarus raised from the dead, but Lazarus, the poor man who begs outside the house of the rich man who eats sumptuously day and night uh, and forgets about Lazarus. So when they both die, Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom and uh, they give him a name, dives, goes, the rich man goes to hell. Uh, this idea is used, or this parable is used to bolster the idea of an immediate, particular judgment for individuals right away. Uh, you can find other uh, evidences of this. In, that's Luke chapter 16. Uh, the penitent thief, where Jesus speaks to the one man who is crucified along with him, who essentially acknowledges Christ as his Lord, and Jesus says to him, today, that's temporal, today you will be with me in paradise. He doesn't say heaven. Today you will be with me in paradise. We're going to get to the intermediate state a little bit later, but nevertheless the idea that there will be a particular judgment of that man today, because he's going to die today. He does not go into a state of dormancy until the general resurrection. There will be a immediate particular judgment of, a, of, of each of us. That's chapter 23 of the Gospel according to St. Luke. You also get the sense of this from St. Paul in his epistles. And I'm just picking out a particular uh, examples but you remember in the first chapter of his letter to the Philippians how he talked about being torn between the idea of being martyred and being present with Christ or staying here to labor with the Philippians. And he says, to me it's kind of one or the other. For to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And in that same passage he seems to indicate that if he were to die right now he would be with Christ. It's better to be with Christ, but for your benefit, I'll stay on and, and help until my time comes. The, the, you have to sort of infer from that, because he's not really trying to explain to us what's been revealed to him about a uh, particular judgment, but it's that sort of sense that something's going to happen right away uh, is, is a part of the, has become a part of the church's understanding. If you, if you resist this because of the sense of time, you know, uh, once you're outside of time, what does it mean to uh, wait? You know, it, how do you wait when there's no time? Waiting is temporal. It could be that when you die, that particular judgment and the general judgment are blended together because time is gone now. So, but nevertheless, we're just reading the scriptures and we're talking about uh, judgment um, a particular judgment, and a general judgment. Uh, in the Old Testament, you'll find this in the prophets, um, uh, referred to by a number of sort of titles, but you'll hear about the day of the Lord, and you'll hear about the last day in the prophets, uh, Isaiah and elsewhere. But in, uh, once again, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, you can see how this is not what St. Paul was talking about of, uh, in other words, to die is to be with Christ. He says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And every one of us shall give account of himself to God. At some moment, 
those who aren't even born yet in Paul's time, will also stand with him at the same time in some kind of a general judgment. Uh, in the book of Revelation, you, you see the sheep being separated from the goats. And in other um, scriptures, you, you, you hear this conversation about the last day and the final judgment. Uh, Matthew 19, when Jesus speaks uh, about this, uh, the scriptures say, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And so he's speaking to the apostles, and basically laying out a scene for them, where they will also sit with him in some sort of thrones of judgment in some kind of a last day judgment, which seems, the church has discerned, this, which seems different than the particular judgment of individuals on the day that they, they die. There will be a general day where uh, all will be resurrected and we'll all stand before the throne. And as my... Uh, my scholarly uh, brother, professor at Erskine once said, after having done his PhD thesis on apocalyptic literature and studied everything he could possibly understand about Revelation and, and uh, the Gospels and, and all other apocalyptic literature at the time that was written at the time, he said, I only know three things then. Uh, when it happens, I'll be there, I'll be on time, and I'll stay till it's over. That's it. And he had read and studied everything in original Greek and in all the ancient literature. For at the time that Revelation was written, there were other apocalyptic literatures that already existed, and they all had the same sort of sensibility. This idea of a, a general judgment. When is it going to be? I wouldn't get your date book out. Um, it's been done a number of times. You know, when is this going to happen? It's, it's good to have it in mind. Uh, but I tell you what, if, if you say, well, that's fine because judgment is a long way off. Not necessarily. If you talk about the particular judgment, that could be this afternoon, as far as we know. Um, last Sunday we read from the exhortation, um, and we'll read it again here at the end of our course today. But what does the exhortation say? Judge therefore yourselves, brethren, that ye be not judged. In other words, we're not sure when this is going to happen, when the particular judgment is going to happen, but we know you have a chance today to judge yourself. That's a good start. <laughs> Prepare yourself for the particular judgment at least today before, as St. Paul says, you come to eat and drink of the body and blood of Christ. You should submit yourself to a judgment um, any, any thoughts about that, first of all, the, the particular judgment and the general judgment, or the last day? Um, uh, please, Susan. Right. Right. It's, the word assure is, is more better. So for those who couldn't hear the recording or, or the microphone didn't pick up, the question was, if we're talking about an intermediate state where today you will be with me in paradise, as Christ says to the thief on the cross, and then following that there will be a general judgment, is there a chance that the person who's in paradise will then be decided to have been unworthy and go to hell? And the answer is no. Um, but paradise is a place of waiting, an intermediate state, which we'll get to at the end. Um, and Joshua Kimbrell has an addition. Uh, uh, actually, it's, it's a positive thing, but I've never heard any church father say that if you're in paradise with Christ, then you're going to go to hell or to the final judgment. Right. A lot of church fathers say that you should pray for those that are suffering torment now, that are judged and are being punished now. Because there's a chance that God will have mercy upon them at the general judgment. Um, right. That's a pretty consistent tradition in Christian 
Christmas period. That's one so, reason we may pray for the party. So if we, we're going to get to the idea of purgatory at the end here. Um, but nevertheless, if you want to find an intermediate state that is actually referenced in the scripture, you'll find paradise. Because Jesus talked about paradise. And in, the, in, in his parable about Lazarus, there seems to be something of an Abraham's bosom, something like a paradise. Um, if you want to find purgatory in the scripture, you'll have to look harder um, because there isn't, it's not so explicit, but it's been, what's the word, also inferred from the characteristics that we know of God, but not not necessary. And so purgatory is one of those ones where it's like, well, um, it doesn't say explicitly, but it could be. I mean, it doesn't say explicitly not either. Anyway, we should get, we should get through this first, and then we'll get to the intermediate state. But, but when he says to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, the church generally says, that's, that's like a Abraham's bosom. It's like a waiting room for the final judgment. And there's no way that you're going to screw up in paradise and, and lose it all or something like that. But, uh, but let's continue on the nature of judgment itself. So we got the particular and the general. and we're, You can't talk about this without dabbling in the intermediate state. Uh, that is, yeah, anyway. So let's talk about the nature of judgment. I'm calling it if-then judgment. Okay, um, Old Testament, in Eden... If you eat of this tree, then you will die. She's aware of it. Adam's aware of it. They eat of the tree. Therefore, death is entered into uh, the picture. We talked last week about the first time death was ever mentioned in the Scripture, and it was right there uh, in in the book of Genesis, in the stipulations for man and woman in the Garden of Eden. If then, if you eat of this, there will be judgment. If you eat of this, there will be a form of condemnation. If you don't, so here's another one. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy is, uh, the word itself means second law. It's a fifth book of the, of the Old Testament, and it's a recap of the first four books, really. And it's not a second law, like a different law, but like this is the law... Um, told a second time, and compressed. Uh, But if you read the book of Deuteronomy, you'll find a lot of, if you do this, then you will be blessed. If you don't do this, then you will be cursed. In other words, there will be a judgment. There will be a discerning, did you do this? Did you not do that? Therefore, you will be blessed. Therefore, you will be cursed. The nature of judgment involves if then. Um, that's, uh, we're, we're in the Old Testament here. But if you continue throughout the Old Testament, we've been in Eden, Genesis, we've been in Deuteronomy, the end of the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, the law. And then you find how uh, Israel was run prior to kings, was with judges who would make judgment upon circumstances and situations, uh, which things were right, which things should be Uh, lauded, which things should be punished. And then you look to the kings and you find uh, most notably King Solomon, who was wisest of the kings, the three uh, first kings, Uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. He is notably the wisest man in the world at the time. Uh, In other words, he was able to judge right from wrong, truth from lie, and good from evil. The prophets are always calling the people back to righteousness and warning them of judgment. You have done wrong, Israel. Repent and return. Or the destruction will come. And they sometimes repent and sometimes don't. And when they don't, they usually get conquered by the Assyrians or the Babylonians. And when they do, they they typically uh, are blessed in some manner or form. Nevertheless, you you, you really see that the theme of judgment runs all throughout the Old Testament. It's all there from the Garden of Eden onwards, and it's still running today. And so we talk about the New Testament uh, in just a moment, but you see that ultimate judgment is always relegated to God. You find this especially in the prophets and in the Psalms, the Psalter, 
uh, David never really refers to his own judgment as king. Uh, he's always referring to the Lord's uh, judgment in the end, which is suggesting constantly a final judgment. There'll be a final reckoning. But in the New Testament, this is where we, we get down to our own circumstance here, uh, is there an if-then judgment in the New Testament, and can we bypass it? Because wouldn't that be nice if we could just get around all of this and get out on the other side scot-free? Uh, the scot-free gospel, <laughs> okay? A church of scot-free out there, well, I'm sure we'd be we'd double in membership right away. Anyhow, uh, is there still an if-then? Well, the very unpopular scripture of Christ indicating a judgment on what you do and don't do is quite evident, actually, in the book uh, well, in several places, but in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, he's actually talking about the eschaton or the end. And he's saying, that which you've done unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me. That which you've not done unto the least of these, you've not done unto me. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Holy cannoli. That's some heavy stuff. And you'd say, oh, well, you know, Jesus, uh, St. Paul hasn't come yet. Just wait. We'll learn about grace after this. You know, Jesus hasn't read St. Paul's epistles yet. And so once he learns the nature of the gospel, Jesus will straighten out and he'll, you know, so if you find yourself saying that Jesus didn't understand yet, okay, <laughs> that's not a good sentence, a good way to start a sentence about judgment, not a safe way. There are a number of places in which uh, you, could, you could point to this notion of the if-then still is in place. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is like a landowner who departs and leaves some money with three of his servants. Ten talents to one, five talents to the other, one talent to the next. And the guy with one goes and buries it because he knows that, that his master is a, is, a, is a hard man. What, what's the word? Severe. A severe man, a hard man. And so he didn't want to lose the one. Um, but, but the master returns and he takes account. There's a judgment. That's not uh, done away with because of something St. Paul said. That's what Jesus says. That's what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like that. Okay. <laughs> I noticed after the last class, I didn't get any applause at the end of the class. <laughs> You're talking about death. So judgment. Well, you say, oh, everything's different now. Jesus has been here. Everything's different. Okay, Ananias and Sapphira. Very first uh, uh, few chapters of the book of Acts. Okay, the Holy Spirit has descended upon the church, and Ananias and Sapphira lie to the church about having uh, sold their property and given it all to the church. And they actually gave half of it and kept half to themselves. Nothing wrong with that, but don't tell me you've sold everything. They indicated that they had given all, and they lied. And they died after they lied. And you'd say, oh, no, no, it's different now, because the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is upon them, and you can do anything, and you're good. Where do we get that from? <laughs> you can do anything you want to do. Okay, I, I challenge you to go through the four Gospels and find the place where it says, because Jesus is, has come, you can do whatever you want to do and it doesn't matter. Um, it's not there. And you try to find it in St. Paul, but you'd have to take a couple of verses out of context and not read anything else in St. Paul, and then you can get to that idea of, I can do whatever I want to do. It just isn't there, sorry. So let's talk about grace in St. Paul's letters. He says this. This is a very important passage. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk according to the Spirit. Oftentimes we skip that second part of the sentence. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, comma, who walk according to the Spirit. There's a walking involved in that ontological, real state of being in Christ, in Christ in you, He dwells in you, you dwell in Him, not so far from asking Jesus into your heart to have Jesus within you, and you dwell within Him, and then you can walk according to the flesh. No, no, no. 
That's a part of having Christ dwell in you is you now walk according to the Spirit. And you, uh, you're not going to quench the Spirit. Okay, so this says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say there won't be judgment. In other words, it won't be a, a this and not that. It doesn't say that there won't be a final reckoning for the things that have happened in your life. But it does say there will be no condemnation. Um, and you can, you can uh, make of that what you will, but that's just what, the, that's just what it says. Um, there have been many attempts to say uh, it doesn't matter what you do, uh, as long as you ask Jesus into your heart or something like that uh, at summer camp, it doesn't really matter what you do anymore, you're saved. And it doesn't, it doesn't uh, affect. All I'm saying to you is read the rest of the scriptures and you'll find that cannot, that just cannot be right. If you lean on Christ, if you place yourself at the foot of the cross, if when you commit sin either in, by surprise or by willfulness, you then repent of those sins and you, like Jacob, wrestle with God in that way, then it makes, makes a little bit more sense. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, if you want to say Ananias and Sapphira were in Christ Jesus, you could easily say they were not walking according to the Spirit. There was, the footsteps were going the opposite direction. That appears to be important in the New Testament. Um, that's important as heavy-duty stuff. There's some more heavy-duty stuff to come. Any questions or thoughts about that? Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unload on you here what has been called the legal fiction. Okay, uh, This may be upsetting. I don't know. The gospel is preached sometimes treating judgment in a forensic mode. Uh, and the, the popular scene of the courtroom is given to the notion of salvation, where you are guilty, okay, and you're in the dock, and you're guilty, but Jesus or the Father declares you to be innocent, therefore you are, in a real sense, fictionally innocent, because you know you're not innocent, but he says you're innocent. He declares it, he changes your name tag from uh, guilty to innocent, and now we only see the name tag innocent. But you're actually a guilty person, but we've declared you to be innocent. Uh, critics of this would call that a fiction, okay? Um, and you're fictionally innocent, and this, this, I think, is a descendant of the philosophy of nominalism, which we got into a little while ago, which is things are whatever God says they are rather than what they are in themselves. I'm much more of a realist than a nominalist, so I think God is interested in you actually being righteous than you being called righteous, okay? So uh, we continue. How can you be really innocent? By the way, this is called imputed righteousness. It's been imputed to you. You've been named righteous. Sometimes people say, uh, talk about God having forgotten, okay? Um, in other words, he doesn't remember your sins anymore. I think that's a literary device, okay? Are you going to tell me that you remember something that God has forgotten? And that if you confess it, he'll remember? <laughs> it just doesn't work. It's a, it's a hyperbole. It's a way of talking about your sins are so far from you now, it's like the east from the west. It's as far as it can possibly go. It's like God forgot. But don't tell me he, that an omniscient God forgot. He, he remembers. But it's been, uh, something has changed. How can you be really innocent? How can you be declared worthy? Uh, and this is more better. <laughs> this is incorporation theology about judgment. Um, do you avoid condemnation because you are covered by the blood of the Lamb or declared to be innocent, imputed righteousness? I don't mind covered by the blood of the Lamb unless you mean that the part that's covered is just rotten. And it just happens to be covered. That's all. You're rotten and you're covered. 
I don't know. I don't like it. <laughs> uh, now, this, this has been, this has been uh, attributed to Martin Luther many times. I'm not sure that he said it. But anyway, the, the images of snow-covered dung. Have you ever heard that? Okay, so you're actually a pile of garbage. But the Lord covers you with snow so that you look white as snow. But you know that within you, you are a rotter. I mean, and... And hmm, there's just uh, nothing good about you, and there's nothing ever will be good about you. And though he's covered you, you know the truth, and he knows the truth. But we're going to play this game and say you're, you're innocent, uh, but you're actually a, a real crud. That's not uh, awesome, in my opinion. I'm not sure that Martin Luther ever said that, but it's always uh, attributed to him. It sounds a lot more like whitewashed tomb, and the Lord is not happy with the whitewashed tomb. So what can we do that would be better than that? What does the scripture seem to, to speak about? Or are you incorporated into Christ so that his righteousness is actually yours? The idea of an infused righteousness, okay? There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if there's ever been a righteous person to walk the face of this planet, it's been Jesus Christ. And if you would like to be righteous yourself, you cannot be in Martin Luther, or in uh, Thomas Aquinas, or in uh, Buddha, or, or anyone else, you need to be in Jesus Christ, and He needs to be in you. So much so that you've decreased, and He's increased, and that that process is ever continuing. You're decreasing, and His increasing. So that it's not so much that you're covered over, that you're a, piece, a pile of garbage covered over by snow, but Christ is in you and you are in Him, which in, in a sense is an ontological union, okay? Such that you could be called a Christian, a Christian, or He could be thought of as your head and you as the body, that it's one organism that you're a part of. Uh, so I, it's, it's a more better... <laughs> idea about righteousness, about, about how you could withstand a particular judgment or a general judgment? How could it be that accounting for all of your stuff, you're still considered okay? Um, do we have to play a fictional game, or can we say, Christ is in me, and I am in Christ, and I've got to find whatever means he's given me to remain in that state of grace, divine life, um, which begins in baptism, by the way. God can do whatever He wants to do, but He's given the church the sacraments. We begin in baptism. We have a service here every week at 8.30 and 11 to help maintain your soul's nourishment and participation in Christ. And so much as you keep yourself outside of that, I don't know what to tell you. He's given you the means of grace. He's given you the way to participate, to be a part of this. Um, I know you've got other things to do, but I know you've got nothing better to do, okay? And it's, it's an hour. It's an hour and a half a week. It's pretty good. So when we, uh, when we, when we think about these things, we think about it in terms of the judgment. What was it? Uh, many of you are familiar with the evangelism explosion, um, which is a method of evangelism wherein a person is asked two questions. And the first question is, if you were to die tonight, you've heard this question, if you were to die tonight, how does it go? Uh, it's like, are, you, are you sure that you would, be, you would go to heaven? And then the second question is, if you were to stand before the Lord tonight in judgment, what reason could you give that he should accept you into his heaven? That's evangelism explosion. And then there are pages and pages beyond that. A method of evangelism. And the answer to that question is an important one for a Christian. Uh, if the Lord were to say, Why should I let you into my heaven? I think an okay answer is because I'm covered by the blood of Christ. Yes. A better answer is because Christ is in me and I'm in Christ. And heaven is where Christ dwells. That's where I belong. I'm part of the family. I'm incorporated into him. He's the head. I'm part of the body. What else do you need? I've been grafted into the tree. 
I'm in. I'm, I'm, I'm participating in, in grace and in life. Um, I, therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, how, do you, how do you make sure that you're not uh, screwing this up? Well, three times a year, <laughs> you hear an exhortation. You can exhort yourself every single day, or you can receive exhortation. But we say these words. Dearly beloved in the Lord, ye who mind to come to the holy communion of the body and blood of our Savior Christ, consider how St. Paul exhorteth all persons diligently try and examine, in other words, judge themselves before they presume to eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Whereas the benefit is great, in other words, participation, the benefit is great if we are true, penitent, and highly faith, we receive that holy sacrament. So is the danger great if we receive the same unworthily? Judge therefore yourselves, brethren, that ye be not judged of the Lord. Repent you truly for your sin past. Have life and steadfast faith in Christ our Savior. Amend your lives and be in perfect charity with all men. So shall you meet partakers of these holy mysteries. That exhortation used to be read every single time uh, the Eucharist was celebrated in the Anglican Church. It's very long and a little bit uh, chastising, so it was cut down to three times a year. We could do it every day. <laughs> we could do it every time. It's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good thing to think about. Well, we've got a few minutes left. We're going to do it in the intermediate state, but any questions about what we're talking about so far? It's really i got to do it in 30, 40 minutes, so. Uh, Bob, yes, please. Right. That's a good question. At least it's not a time in the intermediate state. That is the already not yet state. Some people like that and some people don't. In other words, a lot of this in a real sense has already happened, and yet in another sense it's not yet happened. In other words, if, and I think the best way to, to do this is to, to think that if you are in Christ, then his destiny is your destiny. If he dies, you need to die. If he rises, you rise. And if he ascends into heaven, you ascend into heaven. And if he is judged to be righteous, then you are judged to be righteous. And you can hear in our liturgy, when we do the, uh, the oblation of the people, it's, uh, let me just flip to it, right? You've heard these words a million times, but you can hear the, the, the words about, about our own understanding of judgment. Um, well, we earnestly desire that godly goodness and mercy to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merit and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching that we and all others who shall be partakers of the soul be worthily received in the body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, with thy grace, heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy for our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, we beseech thee to accept this our bounded duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ. In other words, there's been one sacrifice that's been sufficient. One. Your sacrifice that you bring is insufficient unless it's joined with the one perfect sacrifice of Christ. If it, if it participates in his, it's cleaned up from within, and it, uh, it's, what's the word? I, I, the word participates is the best. Your sacrifice participates in his one perfect sacrifice. And so in a sense, whatever judgment can Whatever wrath could be levied out, and your your participation in Him is your covering in a sense. But it's more like it's more organic than a covering. You're a part of Him, and He's a part of you. Um, often they go on. Yes, I mean, in other words, exchange. Exchange. Yeah. Christ takes everything that is yours as a human, as a part of Him, and then what He is by grace. Right. 
so the, the I, I just resist any theology that keeps us separate and says, we're over here, he's declared us in a quarantine to be innocent, and we're free to go. Free to go? Where are you going to go? You don't know where to go. Uh, Christ is there. He's where you go. And the idea that he'll declare you and you'll be separate and you'll go about your business. No, this is life. If, if, uh, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, then there's nowhere to go. Uh, so in other words, these things are finished. So we, we get to this idea about the intermediate state. We look at the book of Hebrews. Many people turn to this quickly. As, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Okay, and so you could make a suggestion that, that means the immediate judgment. Uh, well, hold on a second. As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. So, in parallel, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, die, and to them that look for him he shall appear a second time without sin unto salvation. As it is this, so it is this. As it is appointed for man one to die and then the judgment, so Christ came and died, and much later there was the judgment. What do you do in the, inter- in the intermediate period between Christ's dying on the cross, ascending into heaven, and his return? That's, that's uh, the intermediate state, the idea of paradise. Uh, if the dead shall be raised incorruptible, what were they just before that? They were in some kind of a waiting period. Uh, um, and this is where the idea of purgatory uh, is, is entered into the church. I use uh, a couple words here, but to balance the terrible condemnation of hell with the mercy of God, which is basically impossible for us to understand, the doctrine of purgatory was imagined, I'm going to say, to resolve the tension between the two. Just because something is imagined doesn't mean it's not real. But it does mean that it was imagined, <laughs> that it was, uh, it was inferred. There isn't a place you turn to find a place of purgation, of purging of sin. But the thought is this, it's not so bad. Perhaps the judgment of God would be right after tens of thousands of years in purgatory. The soul could be redeemed righteous to be righteous enough. I don't like that, but that's where it comes from. And I can't tell you that it isn't, because I haven't never been there. And no, neither is anybody else. So just because the scripture is quiet about something, doesn't mean it's not in existence. It doesn't really have an effect on how we should behave. Especially, uh, I don't like purgatory when it gives people the sense, once again, that now they can do whatever they want to do. Because all it does is add 10,000 more random years to, to this in, interminable period of time. I don't like it. I don't think it has a good effect spiritually. I don't think it's great theology. I think paradise is a better one because Jesus actually says it, first of all, and because it seems to line up better. Uh, I used to be vehemently against purgatory until I understood what was really being attempted here was to try and uh, preserve the mercy of God in light of the terribleness of hell. And the idea that a person who's lived 17 years and got 17 years of immorality and, and got hit by a truck should now spend eternity in hell. It just doesn't seem to weigh. It just doesn't, it doesn't seem to balance. Now it may be that we're just ignoramuses, and that's why we don't we don't see why. But the idea of purgatory was, I would say, imagined to, to give our souls a little bit of peace about that idea. That's a lot of punishment for not much iniquity. Maybe we just don't get it. I don't know. We're totally out of time, but go ahead, Joshua, and then we'll... I just want to say that I think that the best way to understand purgatory is the state of being. If you believe, if you accept purgatory, that you will be made perfect in Christ. The purgatory isn't a place that you go, but when you encounter the all-holy God, whatever is in you that is opposed to God will be destroyed, and that might be traumatic. It's an right. It could be argued that the idea of purgatory is contradictory to the idea of grace. And that, that argument I'd be willing to listen to. But nevertheless, 
Are people going to be uh, sinning and dealing with habitual sin and, and uh, besetting sins in heaven? No. In other words, something's going to change between now and then, and the only thing you could call that is a purgation. There'll be some sort of purging of sin. And the idea that this will go on for millions of years is kind of, a, okay, uh, once you're outside of time, what's the point in saying 10,000 years? It, it gets a little uh, rando, as the kids say. <laughs> it gets a little random there. Anyway, we're going to talk about heaven and hell next week, and, and I'm sure the, the, uh, the idea of purgatory will come up again. So if you didn't get to ask your question, just wait. <laughs> Thank you.